Well, if there is uh, an issue which really concerns the future generations, and I would say which is really crucial uh, for them, and I think that the introduction of Laurent Fabius uh, has highlighted at this point, is what we call uh, the uh, energy transition and also the carbon emissions. And I think that if we can solve the problem of carbon, where we would also be able to reduce drastically the greenhouse gases and a low carbon energy or economy for future generations, I think is something which is part of the positive economy. Is it an utopia? No, it is not Uto in a utopia. And I will try to sh demonstrate this by giving you one example. And starting on this example, picking up on this, I would like to extend this to other environments. In Sweden, there is a town which is called Boras, 100,000 inhabitants, and 50 years ago, it was a visionary city, decided that they would restrict the greenhouse gases and CO2 emissions. And 50 years later, they have brought down by seven the, the emissions. And they've also been able to find a series of solutions with the support of engineers, scientists, companies like Veolia so as to bring down drastically the greenhouse gases emissions. And as you know, we now have pending discussions for the COP21, which is 20, 40, or more percentage. But it is possible to reduce drastically all these emissions. Now, how can we do this? And how can we extend what has been done in Boras? to other countries and other environments. Well, the company I head is recommending a series of options which would help us to bring down drastically the greenhouse effect and gases. The first one is what we call circular economy. The decrease of greenhouse gases is, without any doubt, really linked to energy. But it's not only a problem that our energy experts have to look into. I think that this concerns all the economy and the traditional economy and all the industries. This model, this industrial model, which has been developed over more than a century, that is to say, which is based on the extraction of raw materials, manufacturing products, which then are wasted and thrown away, is highly um, productive of CO2. But the circular economy model is based on a lower extraction of raw materials and recycling of waste. And therefore, this is a model which does not produce as so many gases. If you want to manufacture a small plastic bottle, you know the ones you all have at hand? Well, we have today the possibility of recycling a bottle, and a plastic bottle. And that means 65% less emissions as compared to petrochemics. Therefore, even more drastic is the reduction if you speak of metal. For instance, this principle of uh, circular economy, the fact that we will extend recycling, will enable us very powerfully to reduce drastically the CO2 emissions, the greenhouse gases, and also has other advantages. Because as you can imagine, this also will help us to find a solution when faced a scarcity of resources or when it comes to improving GDPs. Now, the concept of circular economy is really uh, what we have to implement if we want to reduce our emissions. It concerns not only raw materials, it also concerns energy, water supplies. We've already heard a lot about the crisis due to scarcity of water, drinkable water, clean water. So if you can purify wastewaters and recycle them, well, then you will solve 
solve the problem of water scarcity at planet level. And we know that we're doing the same for energies, the energies that we're losing, which are being wasted, the ones we have when they're produced by incinerators, chimneys, well, all these energies can be recycled. The circular energy, if we extend this, will probably be one of the first ways of reducing greenhouse gases. Now, the second basic concept concerns all uh, the, uh, the containment of all greenhouse gases because we don't only speak of CO2. For instance, methane. Methane, which is another gas, which is probably one of the gases which has contributed almost as much as CO2 in the last 20 years to global warming and climatic disruption. It will continue being a problem in the forthcoming 20 years. And methane is a gas which is easier to recycle and to trap uh, and you can reuse it. The methane gas is produced by agriculture and by the rejections of all kinds of waste. And methane can be trapped, can be recycled, and can be reused in uh, some of our networks. There are very simple solutions so as to trap the methane, which becomes biogas, and which can be reused in very many different equipments. And we have today equipments for that, so as to recycle this gas. And this system, which is now being widely implemented in European countries, could also be extended to the planet. And if it was the case, we would decrease by 30 percent the overall production of methane emissions. And as you know, methane is also responsible of uh, the uh, greenhouse gases, 50 percent. That would be the proportion. Now, let's not forget that we have fossil energies. We're not going to suppress these energies from one day to another. Some countries need those energies. They depend upon those fossil energies. So instead of asking these countries to push them aside and just abandon these energies, as Laurent Fabius, our minister, said, there are other options which will help us to replace them, or at least to make sure that they're not as polluting, that is to say, trapping of CO2 when you produce energy when using coal or oil and gas is a technique or a technology which can be used. We know how it works. We know how we can avoid producing CO2 when we produce electricity and when we use fossil energy. Half of the overall amount of CO2 in the world is produced by a power plants producing electricity. Therefore, if we can extend this so as to bring down the CO2 uh, and cap and trap CO2, and then for then we can reduced by 50% the overall production of CO2 throughout the world now. Circular economy, trapping of methane, and trapping or sequestration of uh, CO2 will help us in the future and make sure that we can bring down by 50% all these polluting emissions. So economically and technologically, it is, I would say, at hand today. And it's possible to obtain this result so as to speed up the uh, implementation at worldwide level of all these uh, technologies, we need a system which is an incentive for the economic stakeholders. And if we want an incentive, that means that we have to pay for carbon emissions. Today, to pay for that kind of pollution is not really very expensive, but it's even more expensive, unfortunately, to solve the problem of pollution. This was the case in France a few years ago when the pollution of water in the river, the Seine, we only had three kinds of fishes. And therefore, uh, we started uh, with a new principle, that is to say, polluter to pay. And polluter to pay it means that there is a tax which has to be paid by polluters those who are contributing negatively to pollution, and we also have an incentive, financial incentive, for those who are fighting against pollution. This was the case with wastewaters, which were rejected by some of our industries. This has been 
we had 44 different species of fish and the Seine River this summer. So you see how we have improved the situation. Polluter to pay principle means that we have taxes which are applied on carbon emissions, CO2 emissions, greenhouse gas effects. And that means, too, that it is a very simple principle. It's very Fa fast. That means you can use it very rapidly because you can apply this in different environments. And the tax you have to pay is easier to implement than what we call the carbon market. The carbon market is another approach. We've been going through this experience. It's something which has been uh, partially a failure, or I would say a failure in the last few years. If we really want to move forward and make sure that we will control and supervise all these emissions of carbon in a very robust and long-lasting way. Well, we need taxes, but we also need financial incentives for those who don't pollute. We won't be able to extend this to the whole of the planet. So that means that we have to start doing this on a wide territory. And the European Union, I think, is the ideal lab for that because we have a huge market in Europe. Of course, the European industrialists will uh, be uh, against this to some extent because they believe that it is not a system which will be applied in an equal way or in a fair way to all countries. But having said this, I think that the carbon tax is something that we will apply to the borders of Europe. That means that it we will control and monitor the products which are being imported to France and which may uh, spur pollution. Therefore, the products will be taxed according to the degree of pollution. And therefore, this means that people outside the frontiers, the companies and businesses which export their products will be more vigilant. We all know that this system is compatible with the World Trade Organization. And I think that it would be very helpful because that means that we will be able to set up a political project, it would be extended to other countries in the world. A carbon tax with a tax carbon at the frontiers or borders is, I think, a very appropriate measure. Now, I would like to come back to the example of Boras in Sweden. The one we have been able to trap methane, it's, and we're able to use this gas for public transport, taxis and buses. We have they have replaced fossil energies in buildings where they have offices and in Boras and also in Sweden, there is a tax, a carbon tax of 120 euros. That means that all the polluting activities which are taking place on the territory are penalized. That also means that there is an incentive for all economic stakeholders so as to help them to readjust their industrial system. Residents of Boras are more ambitious than that because they want to have a zero fossil energy city by 2050. That means a low carbon economy is possible. Thank you very much. Merci.